Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Bonnard butterflies are an incredible but often overlooked part of Oklahoma's wildlife landscape. Today, biologists and volunteers are capturing and tagging monarchs as an important component of their ongoing research. At the peak of the migration season, monarchs can travel as much as 200 miles a day, many going as far as 2,000 total miles a year. In fact, tagged monarchs from here at Hackberry Flat WMA have been found in central Mexico. How cool is that? Just another reason to love Oklahoma and the adventures that await you. Morning, Doug. Morning, Dwayne. Thanks for coming out. Glad to be here. We're on a beautiful property in central Oklahoma in the Cross Timbers. Uh, probably pretty typical of what a, a lot of you hunt on or, or perhaps manage wildlife on. And Doug, would you tell us just a little bit about this property? Yeah, this is uh, a property that I actually was able to purchase uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And uh, we actually bought it for recreational purposes, for hunting and fishing and, and kind of enjoying the outdoors. And, and so that's our whole main goal of, of this property. And this property, uh, like a lot of places, needs some work. And so we're gonna be showing some resource concerns specific to wild turkey, but that will also benefit lots of non-game species uh, that people are interested in. And we're gonna follow this property over time and show you how it transitions to be better turkey and, and overall wildlife habitat. Yeah. And the first thing I'd like to really look at is, is the Eastern Red Cedar problem we have out in our open areas. Let's go take a look. So, like a lot of properties in this part of the world, it's been fire suppressed for a long yeah. time. And cedar is, uh, comes up in those areas because it, it, it thrives in areas that don't have fire. And yeah. so the cross timbers we think of as an oak forest, but it also has a lot of patchwork of open areas, yeah. which is really important for wild turkey. And it is. And this, this is one prime example of, of some of those open areas that have grown up in cedars. And uh, this is an area that I would like to improve the turkey habitat on. Uh, and a lot of it is gonna be removing these eastern red cedars. So you're starting kind of with the limiting factor on this property. That's the most important thing to address. That's right. And I, I just wanna, I wanna, and it's probably the easiest and gonna see the most benefit from right off the bat mm -hmm. is by removing these eastern red cedars and improving the nesting and brooding habitat on this property. So it's probably important to mention why this is a problem for wild turkey. Um, obviously right now there's still a lot of grass and forbs around these cedars, but over time they're gonna fill in and they will shade out all the desirable plants that turkeys nest and feed in and it will become non-habitat for wild turkey. And in fact, even right now, a turkey is gonna give this area a wide berth because they're not gonna wanna walk through the middle of those cedars where they can't see. They're very paranoid and they're very conscious of potential predators and they're not gonna spend much time in this area. So you could make a lot more of this land support turkeys just by removing these cedar. Yep. yep. So Doug, the last time we were here, it looked dramatically different. There were lots of standing uh, eastern red cedar, so you've been busy. Yeah, we actually had had a grinder come in and grind the eastern red cedars out of this upland area, this this open area. Um, I would have clipped them, but it was just with them skeletons sitting out here, the turkeys seemed to kind of avoid them, and so I just wanted to eliminate them completely uh, by just going in there and grinding them. So are you going to follow up with any management after uh, like prescribed fire now? Yeah, we will. I want to definitely keep those cedars gone out of this area, so I'll follow up with a fire probably this spring, early spring, late winter, and uh, to try and keep these cedars gone.
Dwayne, this is the tree I was talking about that I think could be a pretty good roost site for turkeys. Uh, it's got those big horizontal branches. It's got a creek below it. It's kind of on a slope. Uh, I think the turkeys would start utilizing this as a roost site if it just had some clearing done and cleaning out from under it. Because you don't see any turkey use right now. Yeah, we don't get any turkeys to use this site particularly, but um, it definitely could, has the potential. And when we look around, there's a lot of cedar in the understory and it's pretty dense. And I would imagine the turkey feels pretty uh, cautious about pitching off in the morning. I mean, most of you have probably turkey hunted and you see that gobbler sitting up on the limb checking the whole world out in the morning, thinking about flying down. They're looking for any potential danger. And in a situation like this, um, they really can't see what they're yeah. pitching down into. And I think this is something that we can, can really benefit and uh, try and get them to start roosting in this spot. Uh, but it's just gonna take a little bit of work and, and some, some sweat equity. And there's a nice open area uh, in front of us where the turkeys would likely want to go forage and preen and strut. So you're going to try to connect that existing open area to this roost tree by thinning out these cedars and getting it in a more open understory. Yeah. Well, Dwayne, this is a, a potential roost site that I had found that was really overgrown with cedars. Um, and I actually had a mulcher come in here and mulch all the cedars out of it, left all the hardwoods and uh, hoping that the turkeys would maybe use this as a, as a roost site. Yes, this is, looks dramatically different than last time we were here. I mean, we couldn't find any place to stand where we could even look at the audience. And, and now, uh, you know, it's very open. I can imagine a turkey feeling secure, wanting to pitch down in the morning out of this tree and not have to worry about a bobcat eating it. Doug, we're walking down one of your uh, roads here that also serves as a fire break. Yeah, this is, this is my fire break where I can burn in two different units. Okay. And so I can, don't have to necessarily burn these together, but uh, it definitely has grown in. Uh, I've only had it a year, and, and this was a previous road. I'm using it as a road and a fire break, but I'm also wanting to widen it. It's grown in. I'm kind of wanting to widen it uh, so I can get my vehicles down it, but also it's muddy. It, it always stays muddy and uh, it really needs to dry out. So the extra sunlight's gonna help with road maintenance by keeping this drier so that you can use it more, but it'll also benefit wildlife. Right now, there's not much sunlight here, and we pick these plants out in an open area, but these are some things that we want to show up for turkey, and this is a daisy flea bane. Uh, they eat the, the flowers off the top. Deer love this during early summer. It's a very important deer forage. Black-eyed Susan, another really important deer forage. In fact, they've eaten the blooms off of it. And the blooms are very attractive to insects that turkeys use. So by widening this and getting more sunlight, we will benefit turkey as well. Yeah, and also they don't feel safe walking down this road. Uh, that's just so grown in and the turkeys, they like to be able to see. Um, in fact, one actually got got hit by a bobcat or something this fall by walking down this road. Okay. So I do want to widen this up to make it a little bit more predator friendly for, for turkeys too. And by widening it, they, they'll feel safe to travel down this road. And so you, you said you were going to do this, I think with a dozer, uh, but you're probably going to talk to the operator about where he puts the blade. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely don't want him to take the topsoil off. So uh, leaving the blade up a little bit in order to just push the tree down, leave the seed bank and soil there, uh, is gonna be beneficial because there does water does travel through this road and uh, it drains from a neighboring pond. So we have to keep this vegetated as much as possible. So I don't want him to a lot of disturbance and cause a bunch of soil erosion. So I do want him to leave the soil and leave the blade off the ground and much just to push the trees over. That sounds good. Okay. Uh, so it looks like you've had a mechanical mulcher in here and widened this road. And what was the purpose of that, Doug? It well, has a couple of purposes. Uh, one of them was to maintain the road. Uh, this area stayed pretty wet, and so it helped to dry the, dry the, pr the ground out. Okay. Uh, but it also provided uh, kind of a travel corridor for the turkeys. They feel safer going down this wider road. And it looks like a side benefit of widening this road, letting the sunlight in, is similar to what we expect to see in the forest thinning, is that we've gotten a lot of desirable flowering plants that have come up, uh, and, and you didn't have to plant these. Yeah, this, this was all native, come back naturally. Um, 
and it's also my fire break. Mm. So um, I'll probably come in and mow this about once a year to try and keep the brush from coming back up. I want to keep it and maintain it as a road and a fire break as I'm using for my prescribed fires. Okay. So we've been able to show you several things on this property that you could implement on your own property. Everything from forest thinning, food plot management, road widening, prescribed fire, roost site management. Um, and hopefully, you know, we've inspired you to try to increase the, the wildlife potential of your property. And I know, Doug, that you're gonna, you're gonna enjoy in the next few years seeing increased turkey use and, and hopefully good hunting on this property. I hope so. But if you are interested in doing some of these practices or don't know quite where to start, you might contact the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife or the National Wild Turkey Federation and have a biologist come out and look at your property and, and give you some ideas. Well, all right. Where are you taking me to lunch? Well, it's a little ways away, but it's a really good restaurant. All right, I'm ready, I'm starving. When I first started doing taxidermy, um, I didn't do, we didn't do hydrographics, we just did plain white skulls. And, uh, and then I had a friend uh, show me a video of it and we thought, wow, that's cool. So we, we actually started doing it and played by trial and error, messed up a lot more than what we got correct. Um, but we kind of evolved and, and got better at it and better at it each time. Um, and it's kind of real funny to think about just doing just a basic uh, shoulder mount to when I first started to doing hydrographics, um, um, what the technology and the difference is and different options it gives you. In 10 or 20 years, who knows uh, what they'll have out there that we can do, but it's always fun to try the new things and, and try to give the best availability to our customers. Whenever we get a skull to hydro dip, um, there are several steps that we have to do. Um, the first step would be taping off the antlers of some sort. Um, we use electrical tape with press and seal. Okay, so uh, now that we got the antlers completely covered up, uh, you can see we, we did the electrical tape and then we overlapped with the press and seal so the antlers are completely covered up. Uh, we're gonna go to the next step. We're gonna paint this. Uh, the base coat, this one will be pink because it's uh, Muddy Girl Camo. Um, so it'll need a pink base coat. So the next step is to paint. Okay, when we get ready to dip, I always open up the door um, because the activator is pretty potent and it's just a good way of venting it outside and the, the air. Um, so uh, we're gonna lay the film in the water here. Uh, I'm gonna hit my timer and we'll let it go for a minute and then we'll spray it with activator and we'll dip it in.
And that's what it looks like after it's dead. Okay, this skull's been sitting for a few minutes uh, in the sink. I've gone, went ahead and cut some film for the next few skulls. Uh, so at this point, we're gonna, we're gonna rinse this off. What this rinse is doing, uh, there's a product in the activator that leaves it slimy uh, and it'll, it'll be sticky so the clear, won't, the clear won't adhere to it correctly. So we have to uh, rinse that off and it takes a few minutes. Uh, I've left them sitting up to 15 minutes. The longer you leave it sit, the longer it's going to take to rinse off. I rinse it with uh, cold water. Uh, you can rinse it with warm. You don't want to get warmer water than what's in your tank. And I keep my tank water at 92 degrees. So I always just rinse it with cold water. And then I'm, every now and then if I'm in a hurry, I might make it a little bit warm. But when that stops, I kind of know that's about how or I can okay, so at this point, uh, we're pretty much done. It's rinsed off. So uh, we're gonna take it outside and let it dry. The sun will dry it off and it'll be ready for clear coat. Okay, as you can see, these are all dipped. Uh, they're out here drying on the outside. Uh, this is pretty much the finished product. At this point, I'll just uh, peel the press and seal off the tape. Um, we'll go, I'll go back in and I'll airbrush the underneath side to match any spots on top that I see that might need a little bit of the airbrush, and then we'll clear coat it. So at that point, it's gonna look like this. This is the finished product. It's got a clear coat on it. And then you can see that I airbrushed the back side and the top side to put it in inside the eyes and the nose, and that's the finished product.
Well, we hope today's stories remind you that Oklahoma is such a perfect place to explore. So however you choose to enjoy our incredible natural world, remember that your adventure starts with Outdoor Oklahoma. Outdoor Oklahoma is produced by the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and is proud to serve and be funded entirely by sportsmen and women and outdoor enthusiasts who love and appreciate all things wild in the great state of Oklahoma. <laughs>